So now I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Mindel de la Torre has been chief of the International Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission since 2009. She leads the FCC's efforts internationally, both on a bilateral and multilateral basis, and oversees the International Bureau's functions with regard to licensing of international and domestic satellites, international long distance, international broadcast stations, and submarine cables. She has been a member of various US delegations um, to ITU conferences, such as the World Tele Radio Communication Conference and the World Telecommunication Development Conference. Having lived overseas most of her life, she's fluent in Portuguese, French, Spanish, and my favorite, Italian. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Mindel de la Torre. Good morning, everybody. It's very nice to be here. And it's really an honor to be here following my good friend, actually, Kathy Novelli. We worked together at the Commerce Department years ago. And uh, she hired me into one of my jobs years ago. So it's, it's really great to see her now as an undersecretary. And um, you know, when uh, I was asked to uh, see if I wanted to take this, this uh, slot as a keynote speaker and speak for an hour, I was a, a bit intimidated. I thought, oh wow, you know, I mean, what am I gonna tell all these people around the world? So um, we, I was working with, uh, with um, one of my, um, she's not an intern, she's actually a, a graduate um, of one of our law schools, esteemed law schools, and uh, Anna Dekovich, and, uh, and then my new, newest deputy, um, Neshe Grindersberger, they were like, what if we look at the mission statement of the State Department and sort of look at that? So that's what we've taken today as a way of um, trying to weave this into what you do on a daily basis. And obviously, um, as chief of the International Bureau at the FCC, one of my passions happens to be sort of mobile technology and how we can get that out to, to, to folks around the world. And um, if we think about it, this year actually celebrates the 45th um, anniversary of the first internet um, message being sent on, um, on internet and then the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. And so technology itself is, you know, is obviously just moving at tremendous speeds and technology brings us closer and then globalization also helps that as well. And so we, we have the two things providing an impetus for all sorts of different things, including political freedoms that we're seeing right now in, in many countries. And, um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just very fortunate in, in my particular life to have been a part of, of, you know, seeing this both in the federal government and then before coming back to the federal government, I had a, a consulting firm. So now I just have to figure out this technology and figure out how to move this to the next slide. But I'm not really, ah, here we go. I found it. It was black and it was little. <laughs> now, I do have quite a few slides. Oops, I think I just turned it off. Did I turn it off? There we go. So here's your mission statement, in case you didn't know it. Uh, mobile technologies help to fill, it's not the, that part of it, but anyway, your mission statement is to create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world for the benefit of American people and the international community. It's a nice m mission statement. Uh, ours at the FCC and the International Bureau is so long that I can't even remember what it is we're supposed to be doing. So yours is nice and simple, and um, and so it's something that we thought that we would you know take apart today to see each of these elements. I'm not going to necessarily go in order of the uh, of the mission statement because it doesn't really tell as good of a story as as it does if you go to um, different things. But first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about some. Um, boring statistics and data, but they're actually quite important. And I think that, that some, you know, that the ambassador and the undersecretary mentioned some of them earlier today. Um, you know, we, we look at the tremendous growth of, of mobile technologies and of the internet, and um, we end up just, think of where you were 10 years ago and where you are now and the devices that you're using. And, you know, I mean, how many people here have at least two devices on them right now? Right, exactly. Um, three? Okay. <laughs> so, so it gets it gets quite complicated, and um, and so the. Um 
first I, I thought I'd start with some terminology just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I don't think all of you are um, as steeped in this as, as we are. And so ICTs mean information and communications technology. It's a large basket of, uh, of, of, um, of um, just about any kind of technology. It can be IT, it can be communications, it can be um, telecommunications. So, um, and so from our perspective, um, we are looking at a broadband world and we're going to that, we're, we're in a sort of analog, uh, non-broadband world, and now we're moving to this broadband high-speed internet um, data usage. And so what do we mean by broadband? Well, the FCC came out with a broadband plan back in 2011, and um, we sort of set some different speeds for what we thought might be uh, broadband access, and they ranged anywhere from one to five um, megabits per second. Now we're actually raising that. Um, Sometimes when you're looking at a mobile device, they'll, some, they'll say, and, and actually the, I, the International Telecommunication Union, which is one of the UN organizations that deals a lot with telecommunications issues, they have 126 kilobits per second as broadband. We don't really think that's necessarily broadband. But um, so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at. Now we have uh, broadband, um, mobile broadband as well, and um, all of your... 3G and 4G phones, those are, are mobile broadband. So when we hear the terms 3G and 4G in the United States, it's often in terms of a, an advertisement that we're seeing on television. And it's, oh, I've got the best 3G coverage. I've got the best 4G coverage. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, the, the three in front of it indicates the generation, the, the number of, of generation, and the G stands for generation. So the first generation phones were the ones that uh, we, we saw earlier from the ambassador, big, clunky, heavy phones, um, analog. We went then to the second generation, which was simple devices. They were your old flip phone kind of, uh, of devices that were the first digital. That was 2G. And then things got complicated, and we went to 3G and 4G. And there's not, you know, the it's five different standards for 3G. Now we've sort of converged on one for, for, um, for 4G, LTE. And so... And the important thing is, is that as we move up those ranks, the devices are becoming more interesting to us. They're much more data driven, they're, and they're, they're actually sucking up a lot more spectrum, which is one thing that we work with the State Department in um, trying to get more spectrum around the world for these particular devices. By my little thing, go to the next one. Oh, this slide. It's here just for reference, but in case you wanted to know the evolutionary path of, uh, of mobile technology, it's here. So um, there's different ways of getting there, and, um, and we're there now. Um, how many mobile subscribers are there in the United States? Basically one for every person that's here. Um, some of us don't have uh, mobile technologies, and so we're double counted with everybody who showed up their, their, uh, their, two, their, their hands for two or more devices. But one of the things that we're seeing is that the revenue for mobile data is becoming just really quite outstanding. It's, 70, it's over $72 billion in the first part of this year. And the app economy, which didn't even exist really um, five years ago, is now, uh, it's got almost three quarters of a million uh, jobs, and it has, uh, it's a multi-million, a multi-billion dollar industry, areas that we didn't even have jobs before. How many people here have, um, are using only a cell phone and have no phone, no landline phone at home? Wow, wow. I didn't expect that, I have to say. Um, my statistic here says that it's gonna be over 60% by 2024. Well, you guys, that was almost 60% right here in this room. So cord cutting is when you don't have a, 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 a fixed device at home and that you're using your mobile device. And of course, that is the trend around the world as we'll, that we'll see in a, in a minute. Now, CTIA, which is the Cellular Telephone Industry Association, is um, one of the, you know, it represents a lot of the, the, um, those different uh, industries. They came out with something just this week, actually, and it goes from 2010 to 2013, to, to 2013 and looking at the differences in those things. So we have, um, and the total number of smartphones um, in the U.S. increased from 78 million to 175 million. So that really means that almost everybody now is getting toward um, having a, a, a smartphone. And then also we have um, 
those uh, those that that have the smartphones, it's eight times as much um, um, download speed that they had before. So it's really increasing. Um, the mobile apps, as I mentioned before, they went from 800,000 to um, to 3.5 million, which is a 347 percent increase. Huge. Um, data traffic has increased at a 700 percent um, rate, which is in really amazing. And then this one I did not know, but of course it does sort of reflect the fact that you had a small amount of, of uh, um, LTE or 4G subscribers. It went from 200,000 um, in 2010 to now more than 9 million, um, an increase of 44,000. So, but by the way, we in the United States are the leaders in the deployment of 4G. Um, I, I, often go to Europe and the Europeans are always very proud of the fact that they have GSM everywhere, they're very proud, da da da. Well, they stayed there. They didn't actually invest in 3G and 4G and in the United States we did. And we also had a, a much different um, way of allowing our, uh, it was a flexible use of our spectrum and the Europeans had a very sort of uh, rigid way that you could only put 2G in certain spectrum and then 3G in other spectrum and we said look operators do whatever you want bring that spectrum in you use that spectrum for whatever um, you know advanced uh, mobile telecommunications that you can so now we're the leaders in the world half of the LTE uh, 4G subscribers of the world are in the United States and 35% um, Actually, it's, it's, it's actually more like, like half than, than 35%. And then 95% of the Americans are, are covered. Now, that doesn't mean that 95% of, of people have that, obviously. So this is one of those maps that you see, you know, advertised. Um, but it does mean that people, if they wanted it, they could get it. Now, um, let's look at the, at the statistics worldwide because I think this is relevant to what it is that the, most of the folks um, in this room and watching around the world are, are looking at. By the end of 2014, there's, there should be a mobile subscription rate of almost, nine, uh, uh, almost 7 billion uh, people. And um, basically, it, it does, I don't mean it by people actually, it's subscriptions because some people like the people in this room, have more than two. But it does mean that three point, they, they're looking at 3.4 billion people as unique mobile phone users. Now, 75% um, of these subscriptions are in the mobile, are in the developing world. That's very important for getting the message out to them. Um, and over 50% are in Asia Pacific. Of course, you have China and India included in, in those, those um, statistics, so that's why it's so much higher. Now, um, the mobile subscriptions continue to grow. 6% um, on year, and there are 80 million new subscribers in the first quarter of, uh, in the second quarter of 2014. And as I said before, smartphones, not just in the United States, but around the world, are increasingly being um, bought as, you know, the, the, the consumer device of choice. And so there's an estimated, by 2019, so in, in five years from now, there should be over 5 billion um, smartphone subscriptions, which means not just the device, but also it comes with the data and the internet connectivity that's so important. And so, um, and, and that will be, you know, most of that will be in the developing world. And the highest growth uh, sector in the ICT area is mobile broadband, and it grew by 20% uh, during 2014. And it used to be that, that um, people had two to one kind of, uh, it was basically two, two mobile phones to, to one um, fixed um, line around the world. Now it's three to one, and in many countries, no, okay, some of these are actually small island states like Singapore and Bahrain, but the, the mobile broadband, not just the mobile, but the mobile broadband um, penetration is over 100%, so that's really quite high. Um, and then the global LTE mobile broadband subscriptions is now at about 250 um, a million. And there should be about 2 billion LTE subscribers in about five years. Now, I have to tell you that a lot of these projected um, numbers end up being low and that they end up being achieved a lot earlier. But these are what other people are saying. And so, um, so by 2019, they're thinking that, that one out of three people will be having an LTE device. 
So this was a, um, a Pew Research Center did a, a study on about 24 countries, and more than half of the population in these countries um, basically said that they owned a phone. Now, if you look at the top, it, I think it's hard to, hard to read exactly what those countries are, but it's uh, China and um, um, you know Brazil, uh, uh, Chile, South Africa, Russia um, are at the top of this list, and they basically almost reach 100% penetration. Um, now, I don't know if anybody's, I'm sure a lot of you actually have lived in developing countries around the world. There really is a lack of of, uh, of fixed line um, in infrastructure. So what's happened is that every that they in the in developing countries in particular, people have leapfrogged from they don't even have to wait in line or to wait for a, a, a you know the local phone company to come out and, and build a line, they actually just go to the store and buy a, a cell phone, you know, that day. And so that has become the common way of, of doing things. Like in countries like um, Ghana and uh, in other African countries, you may only have a 1% penetration rate of, of um, landlines. So when you're looking at, at all of a sudden having, you know, 50%, 70%, um, penetration of mobile phones. It's really just taken, uh, it's, it's changed things completely. And of course, um, and one of the things that, that we were requested to do today was to text and to tweet and to do whatever. So bef beside talking on the cell phone, um, one of the, the big things to do is to text, obviously, around the world, and that was that's considered to be a relatively inexpensive way of, um, of, of talking. And um, basically, you know, it, it, I, I would say that almost, you know, that it says 78% of the mobile phone users use, use texts, um, and I think we see that. So now what I'd like to do is to sort of move on to that, what I was telling you that we were going to do, which was to, to look at the, the, um, the mission statement. And so mobile technologies can create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world. What do we mean by extending economic and commercial opportunity uh, around the world? And then um, by security, we're talking about um, helping in humanitarian relief efforts preparedness, um, improving health and, and safety. And then obviously in democracy, um, you know, we've seen it all with the, the Occupy um, uh, in, in Hong Kong, the, um, what's been happening, we've been all been reading about it over the last week and a half. Um, and so it basically has altered the dynamics of civic and social participation in, in tremendous ways. So, I thought I might do is sort of go through some of those and um, and just talk um, what some of uh, some examples. I'll give you some examples, and um, I will get to my next slide here. So um, on the economic impact, I think that one of the things about about um, mobile technology in particular and, and technology in general is that it's not just the, the fact that it has economic and social growth, but it's an enabler technology. So it enables other um, industries and other sectors to work better. And um, I remember when we went to we went to Haiti shortly after the earthquake. There we had some issues because we wanted the te the communications and telecommunications aspect of the country to to be restored as soon as possible. Um, USAID had a list of what they thought was important for the country, and of course. You know, you have food, shelter, health, et cetera, as water is some of the key things. What we were trying to, to explain that if you have the, the, the mobile communication system restored, you can get all of those things much easier to everybody else. And that, that is sort of what we mean by an enabling um, enabler of other sectors. So um, when we're talking about the you know, um, economy, you, you can go back and look at some of these slides, see some of the numbers. It's huge, you know, we, it's trillions of dollars. Um, and mobile broadband, one of the things that's, that's been interesting around the world is that the, the World Bank and other um, um, organizations have, have looked at, particularly in developing countries, with a growth rate, what the growth rate of broadband subscribers, how it corresponds to GDP um, increase. And what they found is that a 10% growth rate um, in broadband subscribers corresponds to a 1.4 increase in GDP. And as you know, it's not easy to move that GDP number up. So that's, that's really um, quite astounding. Um, mobile applications are now between 60 and $70 billion a year. Europeans are, 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 are uh, also getting into it. 
the core economy, um, uh, jobs for for app right, for the app economy in the United, in UK it's about seven point six percent, United States it's eight point four, and uh, in Australia, which is one of those countries by the way that has the most, uh, has almost a hundred percent mobile um, broadband, it's nine nine point four percent, so almost ten percent. So this is just the macro, and I thought I'd talk about a little bit about the micro um, aspects. Um, these, these here um, in these photos, the Ambien and um, Commissioner uh, Clyburn and I went, uh, one of the commissioners and I went to um, Gambia. And these ladies are really the very bottom rung of society in, in Gambia. And they um, are out there in very dangerous con conditions picking up um, oysters and um, basically trying to sell them. And they go on a scale, basically would sell a few of them at a market. No, yeah. um, they formed a cooperative and um, basically started to hand out mobile phones so that it could increase the security of the women. So if they knew if there was a riptide or if there was really bad things going on in a particular area, don't go over into the eastern part of, of, of the, the bay. Stay over here. And by doing that, there, there used to be that, you know, that, that like one woman would die every couple of weeks from these w riptides. What well, became so that if, if anybody ever died, it was a, a rarity. It also allowed them to get those economies of scale so they could find out where they could go to market, where they could take their goods to market, and where they, were, they would be able to sell those and for what price. So interestingly enough, a lot of these ladies um, who had never been able to send their kids to school now could pay school fees in order to send them to school. So that already increases the um, you know, buying power of, of these ladies. Another um, uh, group that we went to see were these um, Shea Butter ladies. And this lady on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, she's got her little mobile phone. It's a very simple um, Nokia mobile phone. She's completely illiterate. She cannot read, but it has little icons on it. And basically, she can text. She can text to the lady who is her um, contact. And in order to, to, I guess, in order to make, I didn't know this before. I, I, I talked to these ladies, but in order to get shea butter, which a lot of us use in our, you know, fancy products in Europe and the United States. Um, it takes a lot of shea to make that butter. So each little lady would come up with a little pot, and you know what were they going to do with that? Now they can get, they can aggregate it, and then and sell it to the Europeans, sell it to the Americans who are, who are there. And so these ladies too, for the first time, now they're they're being able to to uh, be educated on computers. They're, the, this lady now is uh, she's getting um, education and she's learning how to read and write, um, as well as as having her kids do that. Um, and so, uh, in another area where we, when we think about the, eco you know, the economic and the economic benefits of, of mobile phones, is mobile banking. How many people here, other than paying for um, your um, your uh, parking meter, have used your mobile phone to pay for bills? Hmm, you're pretty smart. Most people wouldn't. Most most groups, it's it's not that high. If you look at the statistics here, the developing world, Kenya, about, you know, it's over 60% uh, of the people there are using their mobile phones to, um, to, to receive and to make payments. And Uganda, 50%, uh, South Africa, 29%, Senegal, 24%, Nigeria, 13 Then you come down to the remaining countries, 8%. In the United States, the actual number is 1%. So it's very low compared to that. Now, what happens in this situation? You have a lot of people in developing countries that are completely unbanked, not like all of us sitting here, have a bank and you know, can have online banking. So when you're provided the opportunity of using your particular, um, your particular to help you pay for bills, so you don't have to carry that, that, um, um, that money around with you, and sometimes it's a security factor. Sometimes I was, uh, uh, this week, the um, U.S. Uh, telecommunications training group of African um, regulators come in. And I was talking to the one of the ladies who's a regulator from Kenya about the, the particular MPISA program that they have. And she was saying that basically she, um, she's, she pays for everything with that. She pays for her milk. And she showed me how it shows phone, you know, the, it's just a little receipt that shows up, and then she, she buys milk from milk ladies who uh, basically 
you know, gotten all their cows together and they send out things and they can do th and they can receive payments, which is uh, you know something very very nifty for them. She pays her help around the house. She pay she her mother lives out in the hinterlands. She spend you know she'll send her you know two hundred dollars or something you know for for her mom. Um, I asked her if she could do it from the United States, if she could, she could make that payment um, to somebody. And she said, not from the United States, but from Europe she can. So hopefully that will be changing um, soon and, and um, you'll be able to do that. But there's all sorts of different countries um, in the world using this. And it just, it's, it's a tremendous economic opportunity for those countries that, that have done that. Um, when I was in Haiti, basically, uh, right after the earthquake, there was, the infrastructure was completely uh, demolished anything from roads to banks to everything. And so what ended up happening was a lot of the NGOs couldn't figure out a way to pay for their workers. And so they started to use, the two phone companies at the time started to, to introduce um, a mobile banking and it was really, really useful for a lot of the, the, the different countries. So uh, the, the people who were there. Now I was gonna go, oops, I should go probably back. I don't know how to do this. Okay. <laughs> Technology, right. Um, so, um, when we, just recently, just last month actually, there was a huge um, situation in, in, you know, flooding in India. And there was just, you know, thousands of people who were displaced. And, and, um, and so, one of the things that we were looking at was how people had been using mobile technology in that case. Um, and there was a Delhi resident who decided to start using social media and basically started organizing different things, saying, well, we need such and such in a particular area. We need, a, you know, a f you know, they, they do something on a Twitter handle. They say, at Jake Flood Relief and hashtag, you know, set collection points around different you know, parts of the country, major cities, saying such and such. And so they were able to, to sort of organize it that way. And it was sort of called the humanitarian FedEx. So that's, just, you know, people are finding very innovative ways of using this, this technology. And, um, you know, as I was just talking about in, in Haiti right after the earthquake, um, one of the main ways of finding people who had, were buried was through SMS, through text messaging, and through mobile phones. So um, that was, you know, the GPS was helping, helping um, a lot of the people find, find different things. They, um, a lot of the when you were there, you never knew whether one of the roads was completely blocked off or not. So a lot of the NGOs started to develop maps and were using Google Maps, but they would show where things had, had been blocked and, and that kind of thing. So it made getting somewhere, instead of taking five hours kilometers, you could then actually find a, a way to get there. So it was extremely useful. And of course, the, the, the mobile banking that I was talking about. So on the security side, um, Japan, which is one of the countries with the most advanced um, telecommunications and telecommunications um, network. They have this incredible earthquake early warning system. And I have to say that I'm not sure exactly why we don't have it in the United States. But um, actually, there is a reason. That's because in, in, uh, in Japan, the mobile operator is mainly owned, is heavily owned by the, uh, by the government itself. And so what Japan says they do on our mobile operators are not owned by the government. And so we at the FCC sometimes have a hard time uh, telling them what to do. But um, anyway, they came out with this, this, um, early, this earthquake early warning system, EEW. And that came out in, in 2007. And so it's been rolled out. And it was rolled out by their um, meteorolo meteorological um, agency. And it basically was designed to talk to key officials, to um, safety per personnel and the general public to let them know that there was some kind of an earthquake. And basically what it does is it analyzes the seismic data and then it sends out a warning and, it's be and it gives you a, a two or three seconds advance warning to know that there's an earthquake coming. So it, it allows people, if you were sitting here, to, to run outside. It allows people to, um, to, you know, to take cover. And it, it's amazing what it does. It turns, it turns off their bullet trains. It does, it, you know, turns off elevators. It does all sorts of things um, like that. And it's, it's, it's really quite an astounding thing. And, and so during the tsunami, Actually, now they've they've added tsunami warnings to that as well, um, because 
when the tsunami happened, they did not have those. But people in um, in Tokyo, where they had this instituted, were able to not suffer as much um, uh, death and destruction as they had there. So. Um, one of the other um, areas that I wanted to talk a little bit about was the health and safety. Um, in 2017, um, it's estimated that mobile health could potentially save one million lives in, sa in sub-Saharan Africa. And it could generate about a, $400 billion in savings in developed countries. And that's quite, you know, quite, a, quite a statistic in it by itself. Um, but when we sort of think about health and safety, it doesn't have to be telemedicine with fancy um, x-rays and, and that kind of thing. It can be very simple um, texting um, kind of things. So there's a Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative, and it's with the International Telecommunication Union and, and the H WHO that in the fall of 2012 they started, and basically it, set, it supports countries that are setting up large-scale proje projects that use mobile technology to control and manage and pre um, prevent um, sort of non-communicable uh, diseases. And they've all, they have all sorts of initiatives going on. And one of the initiatives going on is this M Diabetes Initiative in Senegal, and that was launched just this year. And in that one, it's basically an SMS um, awareness campaign. And so it helped, it helped people. Senegal um, has a, a large Muslim population. And so it basically was helping a lot of the people through that who had diabetes, who were fasting during the daytime, giving them little hints about what to do and, and that kind of thing. There's also um, a, a many of, of these um, programs who are like the Baby Mana, Mama, which is a, a health um, for uh, pregnant women. Um, and it's interesting because the African countries were some of the first to start using cell phones, to start using mobile phones to text pregnant women to tell them we need to come in to, you know, to, to the doctor. You need to be aware that this is when these certain things are going to happen to your body. And now we in the United States have implemented those, um, some of those very similar um, programs here actually in the District of Columbia. They have a, a program. And it wasn't started here. It was actually started in Africa and then imported um, here in the United States. Um, and of course, mobile technologies can help with the Ebola crisis, as you all can imagine. I mean, you can get information out to a lot of the people who are um, um, you know, who are going out in, in, into the communities and trying to find who has it and who may not, and, and they can send the data back. And, and it doesn't have to be a smartphone. It can actually be uh, just a text message. So a lot of those community um, health workers can, can, can use that kind of thing. And then a lot of that data can be aggregated and, and, um, and moved on. Um, there's, you know, really interesting um, some of these, the Med Africa and the Med Pedigree, they're, they're basically things where people are, can exchange information. They have doctors who will basically give you information on, you know, through your phone, sort of first, first aid and, and, and that kind of thing. So they're very useful in, in places where there are very few doctors. Like in Ghana, I think they have maybe 7,000 doctors for, you know, a population of, uh, of uh, 40 million. No, actually, that's Kenya, not Ghana. Ghana. But it's, it's, you know, it's quite incredible. And then on the health and safety um, aspects of it, this is sort of on the personal safety. Um, I was just in, um, in, in um, Istanbul for an internet governance forum meeting. And there we met with a group of women who were um, basically from uh, the Middle East all the way to um, Iraq. And the middle, the, these ladies were using mobile technologies in their NGOs to help them uh, advance and um, could be anything from a Palestinian uh, work camp to um, ladies in um, in uh, Afghanistan who were growing rice, um, and uh, almost I would say 100% of the ladies were talking about using mobile phones and the security for them was very important. And they were asking about how they what applications do we have in the United States that might be able to help them. And one of the, the um, applications that you know I, uh, I sent back to, to the ladies was this circle of six, which I hope some of you here who might be students and, and things have, have heard about. And it's basically part of the um, Apps Against Abuse challenge that was held by the Vice President um, and the White House. And it's basically 
it's an app where you pick six of your friends um, and you basically have a circle and then you, you can text to them when you're going out jogging, when you're going doing different things. And then if something happens, you, they, they don't hear from you at the end of that, then they can try to, you know, they, they know that to, to come look for you. So a lot of these things, um, LifeSafe is, is very, it was created by somebody on the Virginia Tech campus after that suit shooting. Um, Kite String basically gives um, emergency numbers out to people when they're um, going places. So these are some of the, the ways personal health as well as you know safety um, can can be benefited by mobile technology so now we're sort of going into the the, the um, more what I call the relevant part uh, because we're just reading about all of these things in the paper um, right now or maybe we're not reading it on, on the paper in paper format we're reading it online on our mobile devices um, but anyway you know, if you think about uh, some of the the, um, the things that we've been been doing, we've got you know the civic part participation. Um, I, I, I like this this um, quote. It said, "In the 21st century, the revolution may not be televised, but it, likely it will be tweeted, blogged, texted, and organized on Facebook or the next Facebook, because you know it used to be MySpace, then it became Facebook, and it'll be something else tomorrow, I'm sure." But um, I remember that in 2001. Um, the Philippines actually was one of the very first places that used cell phones to organize their demonstrations against um, uh, President jo Joseph Estrada, and um, they called it the coup de text instead of the you know, um, and that has created fear in other countries. Um, I went to Ethiopia right right during this post-election um, ban. They had had their elections. And we were trying to get the phone company to advance, to, to, to you know, become more, uh, reach more people. Um, and they wouldn't let anybody use SMS. And, you know, texting and SMS is one of the main ways that, that people in developing countries contact each other. And we said, well, well why not? And they said, well, they, they might organize. They might do something against the government. And so it finally it took many years of, of, of pushing hard on them to actually get them to, uh, to, 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 to um, change their, um, their particular um, policy. And, and I, I still think they turn it off when, when they think that something's happening. Um, this, is the social, this is sort of the use of social media. And on this one, we, you can see that some countries are, are way ahead of others. Um, Canada is the number one social media. Um, country in the world, um, and UAE is second. I, I abs was actually quite surprised about that. Um, we're the fourth, um, and but if you look at and South Korea's, you know, obviously in Japan, those are all expected. But if you look down um, toward the middle, and the, it's like the 12th and 13th maybe countries are Turkey and Brazil, and those are middle economies, and they are using. Um, you know, social media like crazy. And both of those countries actually have had um, some, um, have, have used uh, social media to <clears throat> um, do a lot of, of um, organizing of, of their populations and, and different things. So basically about 1.9 billion people now are using um, social media. And hopefully everybody here is, except me, I'm busy. Can't do it, um, but basically, a fourth of the of the world's population um, are using, um, you know, um, um, social media. And I think most people who who have a smartphone are. And I think the next slide has a. Uh, this is this is also some research done by by the Pew um, Research Center. Now, this was a survey, and I think the reason that China shows up so far at the bottom is because you had to respond to questions. And I have a feeling that if you didn't, weren't responding to questions, that China would be way up there. Because when I'm in China, I know that everybody is using um, social media when I'm there. And uh, they have a very high penetration of phones. So it's, it's probably so. But it, it's, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's um, surprising that Egypt is, is up there. But, you know, the fact that Russia is, is up there and they have, you know, highly, um, scrutinized um, internet use. Um, so it's very interesting that, that you know, that, that, you know, these people are, are using social media and other things. Um, and so one of the things that we were looking at is um, how people are using social media for, po you know, for political um, discourse. And it's 
very popular in the Middle East and in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Lebanon, 72% of the social networkers basically say they share their views about politics. Now, obviously, Lebanon is a highly politicized country, um, so you can sort of imagine that. And but and you look at the rest of uh, and some of these other numbers that we have. You know, six out of ten people in Egypt, um, Jordan, and Tunisia, they all talk about politics on on social networks, and that's something that's very hard to um, uh, you know to to stop unless you turn off the, the systems, which I will go into in a second. But um, it's very popular in, in Kenya and Nigeria as well. That's very hard to read, but it basically says sort of what I said before. Now, if I could take a few minutes to talk about China, because China is really a, a very interesting place. Um, it's got, you know, it's considered the most prominent place. So, uh, you know, I mean, as I said, a lot of people are using social media, and they have their own um, social media, Weibo. And it's basically constantly um, trying to stay away uh, in front of their great wall of censorship. So things will come out on Weibo, and they'll be on the Weibo for maybe five minutes. But during that time, because of the amount of people that live in China, a lot of people get their news. And they get their news from local things now that they used to not know about. So if there's an earthquake somewhere and people are, are dying and the, the, the official press doesn't want you to know, they, 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 you know, they can send something out on, on Weibo and it goes through. And Weibo is what they call a microblog. So it's basically like Twitter. Um, you have you know, a certain number of, of characters that you can use. And, um, and so basically there's some debate and then it gets closed off. But during that short period of time, people are getting a lot of their news from Weibo and from um, these kinds of uh, micro blogs. So there was some very interesting um, numbers because the, um, I, I wrote them down here. So it's 30%, so I was talking about how Weibo actually does the censorship. 30% of deletions occur within the first five minutes after posting. So somebody posts and then 30% of those are deleted. And then 90% of deletions occur within 24 hours. So by the time you have all the censors, now you can imagine how many people are watching and censoring. You have a billion people um, using um, you know, social media. And, I, and maybe, maybe it's the way that they keep everybody fully employed. I'm not sure. But um, you know, it, it is, I guess it would be one way. Um, and Twitter is, you know, is basically, um, it's basically censored in, in China, and um, it's become restri increasingly re restrictive. But it's also become sort of a, a, a social underground for a lot of people in, um, in, in China. And so they have you know, tried to, so the Chinese have tried to use Twitter to basically fake people out to say that, well, this is, this is, this is what's happening, and, you know, and sort of to defame people and, and things like that. So it's interesting how they now are using um, Twitter. And so Twitter basically has to come up with, no, 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 that's not the real thing. You know? So then they have to sort of figure out what's real and what isn't. Um, and so they basically, one of the, the examples they were talking about was um, at the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, they were saying, oh, there's, like, there's a danger going on in the square, so don't get anywhere near there because you could get hurt. Well, it wasn't, but it was just to keep people out of there, and so they were you know, sort of trying to send that, send that rumor around. Um, and now, of course, everybody knows, I'm not even going to go into this in, in great detail, but um, Occupy Central in Hong Kong has been on, on the news everywhere. And, you know, for, for you all who are here, I, you know, obviously you're, you're internationalists in some, in some form, and you may ask yourself, well, what's the difference between, you know, Occupy Central and, and Tiananmen Square, which happened, um, you know, in, in China? And I would argue, when I was, when, we were sort of writing this, this speech and trying to figure out what I would talk about. I didn't know where we would be today in Hong Kong um, last week. I thought, you know, is it, is, is it still going to be going on? And I would, I would argue that one of the reasons that it probably is is because of social media and because of people who are there, they're able to say exactly what's happening. So that sort of keeping people accountable. It's, it's, it's a way that, that everybody around the world can follow it and it would look really bad if the Chinese came in and they would be immediately um, sent out on, on Twitter and all sorts of different um, media. 
Um, and so it's, it's basically, um, you know, it, it's, it's I, th I think it's a game changer. And so I, I, I think that's one of the reasons. But this is um, some interesting statistics that we found on um, social media. And this sort of goes on the where they've, they've uh, been censur censuring. And so um, on Weibo, on Friday, before the protests, they basically had 32 deleted posts per 10,000. Saturday, after the first pro post, 98 deleted posts. And, and then on Sunday, which was when Occupy Central first started, it, was, it had gone up to 152. So the censorship just went up tremendously as things happened. Um, now, one of the interesting things that have been that, that's happened in um, in Hong Kong, in Occupy Central, is that a lot of the um, the um, uh, you know people who are there they're using something called Fire Chat to communicate. And I don't know if if, if you're familiar with Fire Chat, but um, basically they had about a hundred thousand users that downloaded an app between Sunday morning and Monday morning. Hundred thousand people. And then that app basically creates a mesh network. And you're not actually going across you, the, um, the cell phone um, network anymore. You're basically using your phone. You can't be very far. You can't be more than, I think, it's 100 feet um, from somebody else. But it basically creates your own mes mesh network. So if all of a sudden the phone company turns off your, your phone, which happened a lot actually in, in Egypt, then you can actually create this, you can, you can have your own thing. So it's like a human you know, mesh. And, and a lot of um, NetHope and other um, NGOs use that in times of emergencies around the world as well, that same kind of, of, um, of um, technology. So um, now to talk a little bit about Iran. Now, two-thirds of Iran's population is under 35, and basically they're struggling with how to manage technology, how to manage the internet, and access to it. Sometimes we hear about the fact that Iran is creating its own internet, and um, you know, so what, what to do with that. Um, we have um, the, the, you know, the president, um, rather reformist, saying that he views the internet as an opportunity, not a threat, and he's you know, introduced a limited amount of political and social liberalization. Um, except the only problem is, is that there's still a very hardcore judiciary in the country. And so basically it's given, um, the, they, it gave uh, what, WhatsApp one month um, to basically close up shop. And I don't know if, you know, whenever you go, does everybody know what WhatsApp is? You can hear that, well, right? And so whenever you get into an airport internationally, the first thing you hear is everybody turns on their phone and whoop, WhatsApp, right? Um, and so, and it allows them to basically get around um, some of the censorship. So the communications minister said, you know, the judiciary basically accused the commu commu communications minister of failing to comply with earlier directives to cut off social networking sites and apps with immoral and criminal content. So I just wanted to show you one of the immoral and criminal content um, things, and I hope this is going to work. Here we go. So this is a, a YouTube produ uh, production, um, and these are six young Iranians who basically used Pharrell Williams' um, happy song. So just, you just have to think about the happy song. We weren't able to play it here because it's copyrighted. But this is what is considered to be immoral and indecent in, in Iran. Um, so it was uploaded as a video to, um, on YouTube, and it has more than 1.7 million, now 1.7 point one uh, million viewers because I actually went into it but and these kids were arrested from for making obscene an obscene video clip um, and that it offended the public morals and really you know released in cyberspace and all sorts of other very very bad things and these kids were sentenced to six months in jail and 91 lashes for this I you know I, I find it really uh, an amazing thing so it's it's on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, it's it's fun. You should you should go um, see it. I just sort of forgot how to get out of it. There we go. So um, now to to go to another country that I was just in, and um, you know it, it has um, <clears throat> the social media has been very um, very busy in in Turkey as well as Brazil too. You know before the World Cup, <clears throat> and there they basically the social media has been chronicling a lot of the anti-government um, protests in Taksim Square. So it started in 2013, 
<clears throat> and it went into this year as well. And um, so, you know, more and more people moved into the streets. It started to be picked up by Flickr, Tumblr, and, and YouTube. And, um, you know, the Facebook sites basically set up updates on, you know, the uh, occupied different areas. And the protesters were using Twitter to tell, to tell everybody where they were. Um, and then they started to, to realize that the, that the uh, government could watch what was happening. So they started to set up private maps and chats and groups with other people who were um, the protesters. So they were sort of bypassing the actual cellular network. And then um, they would have links that were only visible to the people who, um, you know, who, who knew the, the special handshake or code. Um, and then they could see live foot footage on, um, on uh, Ustream and Vine. And then they could also have people check on people's safety. So Amnesty International set up a, uh, um, set, gave phone numbers to people who needed lawyers to, uh, to represent them if they got arrested. Um, cafes, bars, et cetera, started to send out um, <coughs> um, tweets saying that they, were, they would welcome the protesters to come in and to eat and drink and, and all that kind of thing. And then um, interestingly enough, people, once, once they started to censor the, the networks, um, people would basically tweet their personal password for their own Wi-Fi network at their home so that people could get into it and use it instead of the, uh, instead of <coughs> the, the cell phone network. And then um, in 2014, basically just this year, um, earlier this year, um, there we go, I, I, um, the, the government basically decided to block Twitter and YouTube because there was an election going on and President Ergon was, was basically implicated maybe in some scandals and so he was like, and it, was, it came out on Twitter and YouTube, so he's like, out of there. And, um, and it was interesting because people then started to send DNS, they started to actually post DNS numbers on their, um, on their uh, houses. Um, with with ways of getting around the ban, so they were, you know, I, I think that, that the the a lot of the people in Turkey have now become much more you know technological savvy than than certainly I am about how to do these. But they found the ways to, to circumvent the ban, and it you know became something really interesting. So the um, constitutional court, which actually um, is is working in in uh, in Turkey. Um, lifted the ban in, um, in, on Twitter in April and then um, in YouTube in, in June. So when we were there just recently, the, uh, the, the uh, communications minister was very proud of the fact that they had actually lifted it. Um, just a couple more things about the social media in the Arab Spring. One of the interesting things was that um, the University of Washington did a study looking at how social media actually impacted the political debates in, in the Arab Spring. And they analyzed, you know, more than three billion uh, tweets and gigabytes of YouTube video and, and thousands of blog posts, and they found out that basically, as the the um, conversation, you know, escalated, then it also it all uh, often preceded um, major events. And um, this goes to sort of what I was talking about with the. Um, 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 the fact that, that maybe one of the reasons that we still have I, 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 the central. This is a video. Um, it's a, actually a movie that was created by um, journalists, and they're not journalists. They're basically citizen journalists with their cell phones in um, Syria about the situation in Syria. And it's now a movie, and um, it's a documentary, and it basically... <coughs> It's so dangerous for, for people to be there in, in Syria now that you're having to rely on these citizen um, journalists to do this. This is a story, and it's just the, this is just one little clip of it where the little boy's walking around. And he's like, mm, we can't go that way because if we go that way, there's a sniper, so let's go this way. And then they're like, run, run, run. And it's, it's actually quite interesting. It's, it's in the, the, uh, the URLs there if you all want to um, see it um, later on. Let's see. Um, you know, social participation, very important. I'm getting low on time, so I'm going to go quickly. Brazil, huge. They used um, social participation. But the interesting thing is, in Brazil and Japan, they both used um, one, the, uh, the World Cup and the, the uh, Olympics in Brazil, and then Japan, they're both using it to try to roll out new technologies. And so in Brazil, they wanted to get 4G out there, and in Japan, they've now said they're going to get 5G out there by 2020, so they're working really hard. Um, 
so just to end here quickly, um, I think that, that Kathy um, uh, Novelli was talking and you know talking a little bit about what we can do on, on digital um, diplomacy. I think the State Department's been doing great things there. Um, you know, you've come out with um, you know the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communication. The the um, um, you know a, a lot of a lot of you are involved in a lot of this. So I don't think I really need to go into this because I think you've actually uh, you'll be hearing that. The FCC, even we, actually use new media, and so um, you know we have about um, um, 2,400 um, uh, people who are on our, our um, Facebook page. We've got a Twitter account, and we have about almost 600,000 followers on that. We have a YouTube channel, and um, sometimes that YouTube channel can actually get us in trouble because then we have uh, John. Um, we have. Uh, people who are actually comedians doing, um, taking some of our commissioners and making fun things out of them. Um, but anyway, um, and so we've actually embraced social media, and so we have, you might have heard of it, we have a net neutrality um, proceeding, and um, we've had 3.7 million total comments, and um, most of them are through social media. We've had all sorts of, um, um, you know, Twitter chats and, and public, you know, roundtables and using Twitter and other things. So it's been it's been um, quite active. One of the other things that we've been doing at the FCC is looking at accessibility and innovation um, initiatives. The, the chairman actually gives an award for advancements on accessibility, and um, so he's done things for. Um, it, it's a it's an app that helps blind people tell what the denomination of the money is. Um, another is a PTSD coach where it helps um, people with PTSD. So um, those are some of the, the things that we're doing. Um, so, so oops, oops, I, I don't know how to go backwards. I, oh, there we go. Um, so when we're, we, we have a few challenges to think about going forward, I think. Um, we've got all this progress, and um, but we have huge challenges, and one of them is basically expanding mobile access, trying to get more people on, online. That, I think, is something that everybody here and um, around the world can, can help try to do. Um, you know, promote those global policies and then um, think about some of the U.S. companies. That there, some of the U.S. companies are the most innovative in terms of trying to get content online and trying to get new technologies out there. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Google's Project Loon, where they're going to have balloons, hopefully, you know, going around. Uh, Facebook's just announced that, that they may be using drones to, to bring um, internet to, to places. Um, there's a, a company called O3 Billion that we have licensed here in the United States that the O3B is what it is and the, uh, the 3 billion and it's trying to bring um, um, telecommunications to others. Um, one of the things I think that really is um, something that we should all be thinking about is ensuring an open internet. That's really an important thing. I mean, in order to be able to get all this information out to everybody, we need to have an open internet, and we need to continue to, um, to, to, to push for that. And with that comes a balance, obviously. We come from a country that has a huge, um, you know, very strong First Amendment history, and it's almost sacrosanct, but other countries don't have that. So Germany, you can't, you know, you can't really have any pro-Nazi propaganda. In, uh, in uh, uh, Thailand, nobody can say anything bad about uh, uh, the king. In India, they're very careful to monitor the, the um, social media to make sure that nobody's actually stoking fires to, to have religious riots. So I think in, in your job, sometimes there is going to be that balancing act of that not everybody has that First Amendment that we do. And then something that, that was asked to, to Kathy Novelli was, you know, basically how do you combat misuse of, of, of uh, internet and, and protecting privacy? Obviously, that's a huge that's a huge issue coming up, and I think it'll be something that will be on our screen, you know, screens that we need to look at. So basically, I think we need to work together um, on mobile technologies and see how internet can can. Uh, better the lives of everybody around the world and, and I hope that you know that innovation and communication will basically improve the quality of life and so thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you. That was wonderful. What a great perspective in uh, tying in mobile technologies to the State Department's mission. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, do we have some from the field first? Bob? Anyone here have a question we can have? We have some microphones that are somewhere Good. in the room. There's one back here. There's a question Should back there. Should be on. 
uh, Andrew Osterman, retired Foreign Service officer and State Department contractor. The single largest and fastest growing source of information is video information. The greatest bottleneck in dealing with that is moving from dumb frames to digital objects. Does your organization have a plan or a strategy or an architecture to migrate from dumb frames to digital objects? Well, at the FCC, basically, you know, we rely on industry to do those kinds of things. And so we work with them. We, work, we have an Office of Engineering and Technology, and they work very closely with the industry to get them standardized and to get them into the, into the marketplace. So we don't really drive it. I mean, you know, the, the industry drives it, and I think competition does, but it's going to be people like you who move them toward that. My name is Anupam Shah. I'm uh, from a company called SAIC. I provide uh, technical support here at uh, State Department. I'm originally from India, and when I first left India uh, from a town of 100,000 people, there was only one telephone. Uh, today, the town has grown, and there are, uh, everybody has phone, and it uh, supports the uh, presentation you made very well here. Uh, the, question I have is on the technology side and on the policy side. On the technology, when you look at it, uh, GSM versus 3G and 4G, uh, the interoperability is a problem. And then from a policy perspective, when you introduce uh, jailbreaking and other issues, um, that makes it pretty hard to go uh, around the world and uh, carry your phone and communicate. And in India, recently when I went, the use of telephone or cell phone is so prevalent that even at the airport, uh, the sign for the departure time and so forth is, is no longer presented very well. It's, it's presented uh, via message on a uh, passenger's cell phone. So when you don't have cell phone, it has become quite inconvenient uh, to travel. And I wonder if you have some perspective, both from a technology as well as from policy to allow uh, mobility, true mobility around the world. Right. Um, I mean, I, there are, as I said, for, you know, for 3G, there's five different standards, and for 2G, there were quite a few, there were different, you know, GSM and CDMA, and so those different standards actually breed the more advanced standard in the end, but it can be inconvenient as a consumer dealing with those, because if you have a, CD, a, you know, a CDMA phone in the United States and you go to a GSM-only country, it can be quite inconvenient as you say and so if you are a consumer that is traveling then obviously one of the things that you can do is you can talk to your um, your phone company um, they will often give you a loaner phone to go somewhere what I've done is actually just buy a cheap GSM phone and when I go overseas I just turn that one on and that's what I use and I, I just tell people that that's my different number um, when I'm there and is you know it's circumventing it but um, the the new phones actually you know the 3G and the 4G phones those all tend to be completely compatible internationally. They're multi-banded phones, and so you can actually use those in, 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 in most countries. So the GSM issue will be going away as GSM phones become less, less prevalent and people are using more, more smartphones. And I do think that, that, you know, I mean, think about, um, you know, as you said, people are becoming more and more, um, you know, the, the information that they get on their cell phone is, is more and more important as to whether, you know, you're, you're flight is being delayed. In fact, I think um, Under Secretary Novelli, when she was coming to Turkey, she got an, a, 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 a text message or an email from the um, uh, airline telling her that her first fl flight was canceled. And, you know, then she ended up having to, to figure out how she was going to get to Turkey to make her speeches and all that kind of thing. So it, it can be quite inconvenient. At Joe Cole, uh, retired Foreign Service, now with digital management, working uh, mobility issues. Some years ago in Istanbul at an ITU conference, the, the theme was bridging the digital divide. When I was looked, when you were going over your statistics of the, the spread of broadband around the world, do you believe that's essentially been achieved or will soon be achieved? That original goal simply by this prevalence of uh, uh, the growth of these networks. Thank you. Oh, it's an excellent question. And I do think actually that, that we haven't achieved it now. There you know, are, are four billion people who, who don't have access to internet. So we haven't achieved it, it's still a, a challenge. But the way we're gonna get there is by mobile phones and by mobile devices because um, people, 
a lot of people can't afford a computer. They can't afford the computer and they can't afford the access that they get. So they use a prepaid phone card, you know, phone. Um, they can, now in, in India, you can buy a $50 um, cell phone, you know, smartphone, cheap um, smartphone, and then buy a prepaid card and you can be online as you wish. But, um, and then of course, you know, it, it can be, if, if you need to go download something big, you can go to an internet cafe, you can go to something like that. But, but I think that, that as opposed to those of us in the United States where most of our first contact with the internet was in fact on a, on a you know, desktop, um, most of the rest of the world is not gonna be that way. It's gonna be through mobile devices and, and, that, and you know, looking at it on a, on a, on a smaller screen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause.